all those that worked on that. Thank you for that. Our next speaker is uh, Donald uh, Pro Prothrow. Donald Prothrow has written 35 books. I haven't read 35 books. <laughs> Unbelievable. Um, his talk is called The Mind of the Science Denier. Really nice. Yeah, don't forget also that, uh, in case you did not hear, closing remarks are going to be at 1.45. Unfortunately, Patricia Churchland uh, cannot make it uh, this afternoon. So our closing remarks are going to be at 1.45. Spread the word, please, that our final remarks will be at 1.45. Okay, Donald Prothero's limerick is this for his talk, The Mind of the Science Denier. The proof was incontrovertible, but the man thought it was disputable. As he looked overhead, low bridge, the sign said, now he owns a suburban convertible. Please welcome Donald Prothero. You hear me now? There we go. Thanks so much for sticking out around. I appreciate it. I know some of you are torn with the World Cup final going on right as we sit here. Um, just don't dance around if someone gets a goal. And I will try my best not to run into extra time and make sure that George doesn't do a PK on me. Anyway, since um, we were the theme of this meeting is uh, psychology and brain science, I thought I would try to put together sort of a connection between that and the last chapter of my new book, which is called Reality Check, uh, which is still on the sale stand out there by the Skeptics Booth, and that's where I'll go after today we finish here. So some of you wish to uh, buy a copy, I'll be there. Uh, the last chapter talks about how people believe these things in my book that we talk about, such as creationism, climate science denial, anti-vax, the, the whole range of various types of science deniers. And so if in some ways, I, I'm glad I'm in la one of the last positions. This is a nice sort of capstone to everything we've heard now for two and a half days. And in many ways, you'll hear themes you've heard before, but now I'll apply it to a specific instance so you'll get a better sense of how these put together. And of course, as we've seen throughout this meeting, lots of people don't like the world as it is. They love to repeal reality. They love to deny what's apparent to us. But let me step back in some time, about two centuries here, and remind us of a little bit of where we come from on this. Uh, let's just step back to the Enlightenment period, the late 1700s, especially in France. The man you see on the screen is the Marquis de Condorcet, And he, among many of the French Enlightenment philosophers, who were also many times scientists as well, or mathematicians, as Condorcet was, were also great believers in rationality. They thought they'd finally broken the shackles of the church, and broken the shackles of royalty, and they were finally getting to a world where reason would be eventually enthroned as the power behind human thought. And Condorcet was a great optimist. He thought if enough people were educated, enough people understood science, enough people could be taught to think rationally and so on, eventually all society would be rational. We'd never have any problems anymore with the crane strange things that were common in France in the 1700s or even now. And I'm sad to say, of course, Condorcet turned out to be wrong because a very irrational event, namely the French Revolution, cut his head off, okay? And he learned the lesson the hard way, unfortunately. So we learned that, in fact, humans are not rational. The optimism of the French in the 1700s, of course, has been shattered many times by many different things, okay? We are belief engines, is the word Michael Shermer uses, or uh, other kinds of things. We have a worldview or core belief system. This is what drives all humans, and we learned this over and over again during this session. We've heard lots of different people talking about this. And because this core belief system is so central to the way we operate, we're frequently in a situation where we'll do any trick or any twisting of our brain or our thought processes to justify a belief and make it fit what we already decide is true and what is not true. And many people have talked about this. So Michael's last book, The Believing Brain, was all about how we are belief engines and how we believe then we think, rather than think, then believe. And a very nice book that came out recently uh, by a journalist, uh, Will Stott, called The Unpersuadables, Adventures of the Enemies of Science, uh, where he embeds himself with creationists and Holocaust deniers and all the rest. Very interesting to watch these people basically hang themselves with their own words, which is what he does in his book. And they both point out, again, that it doesn't really matter who you are, we're all products of this. We all have a preferred set of beliefs. We have a core belief system. Some are more bizarre than others. Some are more easily shattered than others, but we can't escape it. That's part of being human. 
And so, of course, the metaphor that's often used for this, of course, take again another example from Lewis Carroll or from Alice through the looking glass. To people who are in a belief system, they see the world inside out. Right is left, black is white. Right? These are amazing tricks that our brain can do under the circumstances where we are forced to defend what we already believe. And of course, we all know, especially, we want beliefs that fit what we already accept as true. So, of course, an inconvenient truth, which was a true title of a real movie, is always going to get less popularity than a movie entitled A Reassuring Lie. <laughs> or here we have our college professor in philosophy, presumably, uh, with a very nice syllogism. If P is false, I will be sad. I do not wish to be sad. Therefore, P is true. And if you can read the bottom there, it says there. Now you have not skipped 95% of all philosophical debates. This is very part of us as being human. We do not like to hear anything that doesn't fit our existing worldview. And psychologists, you've heard this over and over again for the last two days now, have a lot of terminology for this, but I think some of this has probably already been absorbed by you, but I'll just quickly go through it again. We put this all under the broader category of motivated reasoning. We're using reason basically to do what we want it to do, not what it's supposed to be telling us. And there are lots of subcategories of that. We've already heard about cognitive dissonance a bunch, but I'll say a bit more about it. Uh, certainly, we are learning our behaviors from whoever we were raised by, whatever part of the world we are. That's tribalism. Uh, we have other types of innate psychological tendencies that don't come from our environment, that are genetic. And then things like com confirmation bias. You've heard many of these. But let me say a few things about them in this specific context. So, for cognitive dissonance, for example, uh, we heard a bunch of different speakers mention this, right? And this is a very nice definition of it. We hold a core belief that's very strong. When presented with evidence that works against this belief, that, that new evidence cannot be accepted as easily as it should be, it might create a feeling that's extremely uncomfortable, and that's what we call cognitive dissonance, that feeling of uncomfort when these two beliefs clash. And because it's so important to protect this core belief, people will rationalize, ignore, even deny anything that doesn't fit with this core belief. Okay, this is where denial of science is a very powerful uh, creator of cognitive dissonance. Uh, some really uh, juicy quotes here that said this very nicely. The legendary one from F. Scott Fitzgerald, which I've seen many places. The test of a first-rate intelligence is the ability to hold two opposed ideas in your mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. Of course, F. Scott Fitzgerald eventually stopped holding that ability to function and died of tragic causes. And then a very interesting uh, quote from John Maddox, a reporter who was looking at the people over in Ken Ham's organization, watching creationist Jason Lyell trying to reconcile the cutting edge of modern planetary physics with the offhand assertions of a religious tract written thousands of years ago by an unknown assortment of bearded semi-cave dwellers, I found myself wondering how long this poor chap has. Not to overdo the Fitzgerald, but I shall think of the creationists often as day after day they beat on boats against the current of truth born back ceaselessly into being just completely, utterly wrong. So, cognitive dissonance. Here's a nice little flow chart sort of says how it works in a very nice little nutshell. Uh, for example, let's say a piece of information that is shown in the yellow splash. You learn that, uh, that uh, uh, or excuse me, in the top one, where smoking causes uh, diseases and that you're a smoker. So the conflict then shown by the yellow splash is you have this unhealthy tension state. This dissonance ringing in your head. There's two resolutions. In the upper boxes, you'll see the resolution. Um, smoking is dangerous, therefore I stop, something along those lines. But more often, the resolutions in the bottom green boxes, research must be wrong, I can keep smoking. All right? Or in the context of what I'll be talking about today, two classic examples of cognitive dissonance in two kinds of science deniers. Uh, creationist, for example, finds a scientific fact that contradicts the Bible. That their core belief system says the Bible is literally true, right? We just heard a bunch of this when we heard Bill Nye talking last night. And therefore, their conclusion science must be wrong or it can be reinterpreted or it can be denied, whatever they have to do. Uh, and of course, lots of people are uncomfortable with this. Uh, and it's sort of interesting as we mirror the apes, I just wonder what they think about being uh, related to us, too. Or, uh, as the creationists do it, denial is usually very helpful if you have a set of blindfolds and earplugs. And as you see down there in the bottom, protect your creationist police in style with these God-approved eye and ear guards. Blocks out 90% of all known science. And I've seen people who effectively have those on, even though you can't see them. 
Uh, some of you uh, who watch YouTube a lot, a uh, very famous sequence where Richard Dawkins inter uh, interviews this woman, Wendy Williams, who's another one of Ken Ham's people. And he talks to her about transitional fossils, my particular area of interest. And he points out transitional fossil after transitional fossil. And she just says, there are no transitional fossils. And he puts one in front of her. There are no transitional fossils. I mean, literally, that blinders and the earplugs are sitting in there even if you can't see them. Or take it over to another instance, the climate denial. Global warming constrains business, right? It makes us regulate. It makes us do things like cap and trade or whatever, OK? But the global warming deniers' underlying motivation is hardcore capitalism. Environmentalists must not be allowed to enter business, especially when the hardcore libertarians get into this. So therefore, I believe in unrestrained capitalism. Therefore, the science of global climate change must be wrong. That's what motivates it. It's a cognitive dissonance that builds that whole thing. And so once again, they find their own way to not look at the world as it is. All right, so that's one thing, cognitive dissonance. We've heard a lot about it. Let's, let's look at another influence, right? We are all tribal beings. You may come from a small town where you were raised in a particular church, and you're part of that tribe, your family, your immediate friends, all your associates were part of that tribe. They influence your worldview as you grow up. And now here you are in a different tribe, okay? Being influenced by the people you're around right now, okay? We learn our worldview and our values from whatever our tribe is, our family, our community, or now whatever tribe you're with us as you're here at CAM. And as most of you know in this room, it's very hard to be the black sheep in your family, the one person like I am in my family who's not religious, okay? It's a very tough way to be living, okay? It works against everything most people are, are built to do, okay? And especially in the case of being the black sheep in a religious family, right? Your choices are following what you think to be right versus hell and damnation, which your family still thinks you're due for, okay, if you don't follow what they think is right. So that's a very powerful disincentive to wander away from your tribe's faith. And most of you have probably seen this done before. Richard Dawkins has done it a bunch of times. You can predict what tribe you belong to in terms of religion just by where you live and where you were raised, right? Uh, the true religion is the religion of what you happen to be, uh, what kind of community you have to grow into. So if you're from the Middle East, Islam is the religion of truth. But if you're other parts of the world, you might be a Christian, a Buddhist, Hindu, and so on. And I love that little quote there that's down there in the bottom from Mark Twain, who always said it beautifully. Uh, Man is a religious animal. Is the only religious animal. Is the only animal that has a true religion. Several of them. Is the only animal that loves his neighbor as himself and cuts his throat if his theology isn't straight. Now only Mark Twain can say it that way. And there are other kinds of tribalism too. Uh, here we have the big book of Republican science, the GOP tribe. With the universe is 6,000 years old, dinosaurs in Noah's Ark, global cooling, and women who shut down their own pregnancies. All sorts of bizarre, non-scientific ideas that were very prominent in the last two elections in 2008 and 2012. And there are people who have said and written, oh, well, the two parties are the same, right? There's the woo on the left, there's the woo on the right. I say bullshit, okay? The only case where you see that is that the GOP has adopted their, these woo policies, these anti-science policies, as part of their policy. There are planks in the Republican platform and in many states and on the national level. And their leadership all toe that line, especially climate denial and many in the creationism as well. Only Republicans push creationism in public school, not Democrats, okay? Uh, and ironically, although they say, oh, well, any backs is a left-wing woo, no, actually the polls show it's more common among conservatives than it is among liberals. Uh, whereas, contrast, I, I don't say the Democrats are perfect, but there are no major leaders of the Republic, Democratic Party that are pushing Wu as part of policy. That is an asymmetry, and that is why they're not equivalent. If you doubt me on that, just look at the panel of presidential candidates they gave us in 2008, and then again in 2012. The five in 2008, all of them were climate deniers and mostly creationists in one form or another. In 2012, all 12 of them that started out the race were all climate deniers except for John Huntsman and nearly all creationists except for John Huntsman, okay? That's their leadership, right? Those are the people they wanted to make the most powerful human on the planet, all right? Or look at the House Science Committee, which is all run by Republicans, 100% climate deniers, almost all creationists. These are the people dictating science policy from the House at least, and they're all anti-scientists. 
Now, this comes from our, not only just from our environment, also we have deeply ingrained things that are part of our we're growing up, and part of our deep psyche, these have been studied by many people, these automatic, emotional, visceral parts of our brain that are not easily controlled. And in most cases, we have limited control over what we do with these things, because they're mostly subconscious. So we're like the little stick man there trying to uh, control an elephant, which I think is an appropriate symbol in this case. Uh, if you've read the research of, uh, of uh, Daniel Kahn, for example, he uh, breaks it down in a series of polls communitarian there on the right versus individualistic on the left. And up and to the top from hierarchy and strict rigid uh, ranking of people to egalitarianism, equal, equal opportunity. And uh, the people who tend to be conservative, not just the way they're raised, but also they often have deeper unconscious or subconscious brain characteristics that make them treasure things like stability and hierarchy and religion. All these things come with that type of thing, okay? And so that often predicts a lot of their political affiliation. This has been done by a number of uh, political scientists as well as psychologists. Um, or Jonathan Haidt has done something similar here. Next slide. Uh, where the things that make the conservative community link together, loyalty to your community versus betrayal, the sanctity of religion versus degradation, those are very strong things in their community, along with authority of the people above you versus subverting them. And those are not so powerful in the liberal community, where other things are more valuable, like care of people versus their harm, uh, liberty versus oppression, and uh, fairness versus cheating. So there's a very different way that our brains are wired. Even if we're raised a certain way, sometimes we don't stay that way. But nonetheless, we talk about tribalism. We're talking about, again, this deep-seated thing that's built into us and then we are raised with as well. It's very hard to undo any of that with actual evidence, with actual argument, persuasion. You all know this. When I debated Dwayne Gish in 1983, right, he brought in a giant church loads of people to fill the audience, and I had five kids from my school in Illinois on my side at Purdue. And the whole audience was cheering for Gish. I was just the one person there who wasn't. And it was a real challenge because you have the whole room stacked against you. No matter what I said, no matter how quickly I shot down his arguments, didn't matter. They didn't get it. They didn't care. Okay, evidence doesn't matter to these people, right? And I found this out during the question and answer session when they handed up cards from the audience for me to answer. They're all about my sex life, my personal beliefs, my salvation. There wasn't any science questions in the whole stack. It never was about science to begin with. It was clearly a religious issue, all right? And think about what these people are thinking. And some of you may have been in this boat thinking one time. What are a few inconvenient facts if you're damned to hell if you doubt the Bible? Right? That's a very powerful disincentive to accept anything that doesn't fit. Uh, and as we heard several people already say, often arguing with them doesn't do any good. It often does bad things. It causes a backfire effect where they entrench themselves further in their beliefs and you've done just the opposite of what you intended. And so this little church uh, billboard here says it very nicely down there in the bottom line with its strange spelling. If your faith is big enough, facts don't you can't ask for a more obvious statement of what a lot of people think, especially in the religious community. Or here we have In Denial Ham, Ken Ham, of course, with his impossible arc, right? Uh, this is exactly how it works. We saw him after the debate with Bill Nye was in his last minutes. When the questions come in there, he made a whole bunch of statements. Number one, no evidence would ever change his mind, which to me was the, the final blow as far as anyone who wasn't on his camp. And number two, that when they caught him on this, he said, well, I don't believe that pipe passage is literal, it's metaphorical. Whereas this is the guy who makes his living saying we have to take every verse literally. Uh, so this is something uh, scholars have known for a long time, Tertullian in the Roman period. I believe because it's absurd, right? Because it goes against reason. And the same happens in the climate science community, right? You have the climate science community uh, pretty much in its own world and then the fringe of deniers out there who chip away at it none of whom are members of the climate science community and don't know anything about the data. So what you're looking at is a metaphor of testing the scales of these two contrasting viewpoints. So here we have one editorial cartoon says it nicely with evolution overlaying the scales right there on one side and nothing on the other side but faith. And then the man in the slide says there, see, they have equal value that should both be taught in public schools. Or yet another example of our tilted scales one has virtually every scientist in the world on one side versus one climate denier, and the caption there says, either he's that dense or he doesn't believe in gravity either. But that's exactly what we're talking about. The evidence is not even close to that unbalanced. 
So we are very much like in this cartoon here. Unfortunately, this is how the brain works. Sir, receiving information that conflicts our belief system. Get rid of it. Now, another common trick that we heard talked about before, and it very much applies to this type of uh, set of arguments, is confirmation bias and cherry-picking quote mining. They're all part of this thing. We all know what it is. Confirmation bias, remembering the hits, forgetting the misses, right? These are good examples going on right downstairs right now. Those poor guys pulling away on the machines and playing poker and so on. They remember the good hands. They remember the jackpot. They forget how much money they've already poured into that machine, and that's why this casino was here. Okay? Or the psychic. We all know the psychic's cold reading strategy, right? It's just enough tries, eventually you get hits, and your victim will sucker whatever will not remember that they were mostly misses. Okay? Denialists uh, always do this. They find articles and quote out of context or cherry pick a fact, and that's their strategy to try to undermine you and try to get away from you. They basically give you something the opposite of what's intended, or they nitpick on tiny details that really don't matter very much. It's and it's there, so they're going to affect you in some way, and then they, they pick at it. So creationists are legendary. Virtually all creationist literature is cherry-picking little tiny things that are small anomalies. To most scientists, that's no big deal, right? We find a way to explain it sooner or later. The creationists, with their Manichaean black and white, no shades of gray view, if one little fact goes against evolution, the whole thing tumbles, because that's the way they think. Right? So they'll pick to a small anomaly, radiometric dating, and therefore all the radiometric dating must be false just because one thing we haven't quite figured out yet. Or they extrapolate the magnetic field of the past, not realizing, of course, it changes in frequency and changes in direction, and say, oh, well, it can only be 6,000 years old, because that's how far back it goes. And climate scientists are the same way. Here you see the overall trend in increasing temperature through time uh, over about the last 50 years or so. And you'll see there's the real data there in blue, which are very noisy, as any real data are. And there's one point in particular there, which I put the pointer on. That was 1998. It was a very, very big El Nino year. I remember vividly. All my field trips were washed out that year. And it brought a lot of heat in the system. It's an anomaly. It's a blip. And then you'll hear the climate deniers so from George Will all the way down saying, well, it hasn't been warming since 1998. Well, that's about as dishonest a strategy you can ask for. Let me blow up that section now, the last part of that, that plot. And there's 98 right there. Yes, you can see what an anomaly it was. If you average it, it would be to uh, lost the background noise. In fact, every year after 98, for a couple of years, was a lower year just because it's an unusually high value. Then every year after that, it's been the same warmth or higher with a couple of La Nina exceptions. Right? And that's the way they get away with this. They take an anomaly and plot it like it's a, as a major value of something important. So here we have, for example, the other strategy, nitpicking. A board full of evidence for global warming, and down there in the corner, the global warming deniers. I don't want to call them skeptics. Look, right here, he ends the sentence with a preposition. And here, you forgot to dot an I. What a fraud. Okay, and of course, again, creationists are famous. They're quote mining. They, you see this all the time. Virtually everything you read in a creationist book is a quote out of context that means the exact opposite if you read it in context. That's partially, I think, that's because they're confirmation bias, partially, I think, dishonesty. Uh, the climate gate kerfuffle a few years ago. A couple of quotes out of context, out of thousands of pages of emails that were stolen illegally from the computer at East Hadley. And they made a big fuss out of two or three quotes out of context. And eventually, of course, it was all shown not to be the case. The six, into six commissions, three in the United States, three in Britain, showed there was nothing wrong there. But of course, the conservative community keeps this meme going. As our good friend Neil says, science is not there for you to cherry pick. So here we are in this bind. Scientific truth is moving forward. We have lots and lots of people who simply don't want it to happen. Okay, it's a very saddening thing, but very much a true thing. And we just ask ourselves, before we go too much further here, why are we different? Why are we to the scientific community and the skeptic community different? Why are we just as self-delusional as these other people we're laughing at right now? And I would argue no, because science and skepticism together are the reason we are confident this is not the case. Science is always about testing hypotheses and proving them wrong, right? This is a way that gets away against confirmation bias, okay? Always science, if they're trying to talk to other scientists, they're tentative. They don't claim to have final truth. We don't believe in science. We test it. We accept it if it's tested and proven, okay? And then especially something that most people in the public don't understand, peer review. You have hundreds of scientists out there brutally scrutinizing work for 
before publication and afterwards. And if it doesn't survive, it's in the junk heap of many, many thousands of, un, uh, of rejected scientific ideas. There's no other filter on it like that. Nothing on the internet gets that kind of scrutiny. And even news media now no longer have quality control, but science has quality control. And finally, we know science is not something that the deconstructionists say is just a fantasy in our mind, because it works. We've got rockets, we've got cell phones. These are things science has brought us. And then our friend Neil here says it very nicely. When different experiments give you the same result, it's no longer subject to your opinion. It's a good thing about science. It's true, whether or not you believe in it. That's why it works. So here we have this barrage between fact and opinion. And of course, people with their minds shut and shut down and belief systems can't accept a lot of facts. And again, Carl Sagan says this very nicely. The heart of science is essential balance between two seemingly contradictory attitudes, an openness to new ideas, no matter how bizarre or, uh, or counterintuitive they may be, and the most ruthless skeptical scrutiny of all ideas, old and new. That's how deep truths are winnowed from deep nonsense. Okay, so how do we get people to change their mind? We have some stellar examples, one I love to point out. Uh, about uh, well, now five years ago, Richard, physicist Richard Muller, a famous Berkeley physicist, he was a climate denier. He was paid by Exxon Mobil, paid by the Koch brothers to tear apart the climate curve generated by NOAA and NASA and all the rest. And the GOP thought they had him in their pocket, right? He was a gun for hire. So a year later, after the research had started, he had a lot of data on a committee meeting on March 29th in front of the House Science Committee, all run by anti-scientists. They thought they would hear him just declare that global climate change was false. Instead, he showed his data which you can't even pick out there because the black is his data and the other three colors of the other three labs, they're all identical. And he's told his, uh, his handlers, climate science is real, get over it. Okay, so why do people do this, right? Other than the obvious things we've talked about in motivated reasoning. We have this strange need in our country, in fact, around the westernized world. We love science and technology when it makes our lives better, right? It gives us cell phones and the rest. But we reject science if it tells us an inconvenient truth something we don't like to hear about, like evolution or climate change. Uh, of course, our motivations are obvious. Creationists for their religious reasons, climate deniers for the libertarian conservative ideologies. I would submit to you, when science is telling you bad news, it's probably true. Scientists aren't spoiled sports, kill joy. We don't enjoy making you feel miserable. We have no vested interests and no incentives and no nothing to gain from telling you something you don't want to hear. Okay? So if we're telling you that something we have to tell you because that's what it is, and it's not something pleasant, it's probably true. This little cartoon says it very nicely. It shows up in the upper left there, Archimedes being attacked by the Roman soldier, and Bruno being burned at the stake, and Darwin and Einstein. And the bottom right corner says, science, if you ain't pissing people off, you ain't doing it right. So yes, we have been running everything since 1543. And we have this pill, this pill of truth that everybody wants, but nobody can seem to swallow. Or from our familiar movie, You Can't Handle the Truth. So, for the final moments here, I just want to say, what do we do about this? How do we, as members of the everyday community, as well as the members of the skeptical community, deal with this in the real world? Because everyone around us has some of these weird ideas. And we already said, wasting your time debating a creationist or debating a climate actor Climate denier is deeply entrenched, it is just a waste of time. Unless you're doing it for entertainment, which some people do. I've stopped doing it, I don't find it fun anymore. Okay? The best bet is with the vast majority of people in this country who are not actually hardcore. They're on the fence, they're not sure. They may have been raised in a religious church, but they're not completely sure what they believe. They heard a little bit of evolution, but they don't know for sure. I found this out when my book came out on evolution in 2007. I got a huge number of emails from people saying, I wasn't sure what to think, but you helped me clarify this. And if you look at the reviews for it on Amazon.com, I got a bunch of comments like that as well. Right? It helps not to make yourself a partisan up front, but to talk about it as an economic or health or human survival issue. And as Phil Plate said on his podium two years ago, don't be a dick. Okay? Tone is everything. You don't want to belittle them. You want to get them to think. As Carl Sagan said, people are not stupid. They believe things for reasons. The last, the last river skeptic to get the attention of bright, curious, intelligent people is to belittle or condescend or show arrogance toward their beliefs. It's hard to do sometimes, I know, but we've got to do it. Now, 
if you're thoroughly depressed at this point, let me ask, put in a few pieces of hope here. I, I got very depressed about this for a while because I had battled creation for almost 40 years of my life and didn't seem to make any dent in this stuff. But it turns out there is change going on, okay? Religious fundamentalism is disappearing in this country, believe it or not. It's actually shrinking, as the polls show, particularly because they got what they wanted, power over certain state legislatures and started putting in their anti-woman, anti-gay, anti-minority, anti-science agenda into place, and now they're scared away a generation of younger voters ever going with us to them, okay? And it turns out if you look at the countries in Northern Europe, especially Scandinavia, like Phil Zuckerman has done, what does reduce, fun reduce fundamentalism is a strong social safety net. Health care, unemployment benefits, retirement, disability, child care, vacations. All those countries are virtually non-religious thanks to that system, okay? They don't worry about daily survival so much. They don't need God so much. Now, part of the problem, of course, is the misleading polls. The Gallup poll, for example, has a very loaded question gives you only three fairly false choices, and yet they use it over and over because they've used it historically. And so it's very misleading. You get the impression that 40% of the fund country is fundamentalist. No. You actually break it down into individual parts, like how many people in the country actually believe the Earth is only 6,000 years old, like Ken Ham says, 14%. Right? Nowhere near the numbers you thought. Okay? 30 to 40% of Americans agrees evolution takes place, but just not with humans. Right? All right, they're willing to go you that far, okay? 80% agree with plate tectonics, something that the fundamentalists won't adapt at all. Uh, as this room shows, the seculars are growing. We're the fastest growing segment among religious beliefs, the no religious beliefs, okay? Especially with you millennials in the room. You're the future. And there's 45 to 50% of you now who are non-religious. It's amazing. Or, Let's say, look at the other side of this, that poll there, the red dot shows how much fundamentalism shrunk, 9% in just a 10-year window, and the green dot at the bottom, the same 9% in growth in secularists. Okay? And you can point this out by using economic arguments. For example, here's our uh, scientist saying, the creation has found unlikely support among students in China, India. Yes, America, we very much like it if you teach your children religious dogma instead of science. We'd like your jobs. And you say, oh, the climate deniers are such a pain in the ass. They're just impossible to get around. Actually, the polls show that Americans are about 60 to 80 percent, depending on which poll, in favor of the idea that climate change is real and we're the cause and we should do something about it. You never hear that very often, but that's what the, most of the polls show. The hardcore climate deniers that are over there at Freedom Fest, best 10 or 20 percent of, of the population. But the GOP leadership is among that population. Okay? And it's ironic. We as scientists say, Climate's not weather. A snowstorm doesn't end climate change, okay? But it's ironic that right before the 2012 election, Hurricane Sandy jumped the number of people who actually accepted climate change. So even though they don't get that climate's not weather, weather does help convince people, okay? And the basic thing to remember is that we are the only Western industrialized country with a major problem with climate deniers in our politics. Uh, temporarily, Australia has a little bit of a problem, and so does Canada, but that will change faster than we will. So the climate deniers are has been. They're goners. Two or three more election cycles, there'll be nobody left for them in Congress. Okay? And the irony is that everybody who isn't an ideologue is already acting all over the world. Insurance companies, they don't have the option of being ideological. They have to keep their losses covered. They're all planning for climate change. U.S. military, you know, not exactly a left-wing organization, they're planning for climate change. Emergency manager people, my brother-in-law is one of these. They're planning for climate change. Most of the non-energy related companies, GE and so on, Starbucks even, is trying to figure out where it's going to get its next coffee beans when climate change occurs, okay? And the European and Asian countries especially are going ahead with lots of green technologies and leaving us behind and eating our lunches. But the economic argument is powerful. You see on the left here, our scientist says, climate change threatens our existence. He changes it to climate change threatens our economy and boom, you go, wait. And again, the ray of hope as you younger folks in your 20s and 30s in this room, you guys are the future. You're the ones who are going to vote these clowns out someday, okay? And they will no longer have power, especially after the 2020 portion of, uh, reapportionment of districts ends the gerrymandering they did in 2010. And that top three bar graph shows the youngest folk cohort, the millennials. They are 80 to 90 percent accepting climate change that we need to do something about it. They're the ones who are going to have to make it happen if my generation is screwed up. So we're in this ironic position here. We all agree that we need to have a better world. Energy independence, preserve the rainforest, sustainability, 
green, uh, green jobs, livable cities, renewables, clean water and air. These are almost everybody's goals, except for a few libertarians. And here you see the skeptic in the audience, the climate denier in the audience saying, what if it's a big hoax? We created a better world for nothing. Or I'd like to finish here with Carl Sagan, says that the very best of all, um, it is far, far better to grasp the universe as it really is than to persist in the delusion, however satisfying and reassuring. Thank you. Donald Prothrow. Donald Prothrow. Thank you, Donald. Excellent. Excellent. Hang on to those positive parts. One of the, uh, one of the sponsors, before we go to our next speaker, one of our sponsors.